I welcome you back to our study in the last days of Jesus' earthly ministry, those days that he spent at Jerusalem before he went to the cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We know that Jesus was staying at Bethany in the home of Simon the former leper, his more than likely wife, Martha, and her two siblings that lived with them, Mary and Lazarus. Uh, Bethany is only about a mile and a half east of the Temple Mount, a nice easy commute of about half an hour. And Jesus uh, had a dinner there on the night that he arrived. Uh, And then the next morning on the 10th day of the Jewish month, he went to Jerusalem and had the whole triumphal entry story happen with him. And uh, you remember how they were hailing him with the words from Psalm 118, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, save us now, and blessed is he who's coming in the name of the Lord. All those marked this day as being prophetically significant. Uh, First of all, it was the day on which the Passover lambs were designated, and Jesus is the ultimate Passover lamb. But Jesus had also said three days earlier that Jerusalem was not going to see him until they said of him, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and that he had to arrive at Jerusalem on this specific day. Uh, So Jesus enters Jerusalem, enters the temple on the 10th day of the first Jewish month, and we are told in Mark's account, Mark 11:11, 11, 11, that when he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, uh, that after he'd looked around at everything, since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So that's how we know that the triumphal entry happened late in the day, late in the daylight hours of the tenth day of the first Jewish month. And so Jesus goes back to the home at Bethany, spends the night, gets up the next morning, apparently very early, because some of the other accounts, Matthew 21, Luke 19, tell us that this next event happens in the early morning hours. So he gets up probably while it's just barely daylight, starts on that walk up and over the top of the Mount of Olives, and then down through the Kidron Valley and to the northeast corner of Jerusalem proper, and from there into the Temple Mount again. Mark 11, 12 says that on the following day, when he came from Bethany, he was hungry. So apparently didn't have breakfast at the house. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. Now, in a moment, we're going to be told that it was not yet time for new figs, new ripe figs on this tree. Um, Now, Bethphage, if you remember correctly, the name of the town that he goes through from Bethany to Jerusalem uh, is the house of green figs, uh, that is, unripe figs. People did eat unripened figs figs. And so, since this tree is in full leaf, there ought to be some green figs on it. Or perhaps maybe some holdover figs from last year that ripened later and then just kind of hung on through the winter months. Uh, But since this tree was presenting itself as alive, because it's got leaves, Jesus anticipated there should be something edible on it. But this is what happens. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. But again, the tree is giving the false impression that it's alive when in fact it's not productive at all. So Jesus said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard it. Uh, So Jesus makes an object lesson out of this lying tree, out of this unproductive tree. 
and we'll come back to that object lesson the next morning when he passes by here. Uh, because just like he's leaving very early in the morning to go to Jerusalem, uh, he will return late to Bethany, probably after it is dark. And uh, in the moonlight, if he could see this tree at all, it won't be obvious what has happened to it. Uh, so they'll wait until the next morning and see that it's withered up. We'll come back to that. Let's continue to Jerusalem with Jesus. So they came to Jerusalem. That'd be the northeast corner where the Pool of Bethesda was, where the Sheep Gate was located. And then he entered the temple. Now, when he enters the temple from the northeast corner, uh, he's going to be immediately in the north uh, part of the, the court of the Gentiles or the court of the nations. Uh, this is the place where everybody, regardless of their, their status of spiritual purity, uh, can gather for worship. And in this court, as well as in the southern section of uh, the court of the Gentiles, there were booths set up selling sacrificial animals like sheep and goats and cattle uh, and doves, pigeons. Uh, there are also um, stands where you can change your foreign money that might have images of people or images of gods and goddesses, images of animals uh, which are forbidden or uh, customarily uh, not accepted by religious Jews as being kosher for putting into the offering boxes at the temple. So you can change that. Uh, now, these things were probably set up originally as matters of convenience for pilgrims. Because remember, people are coming from all over the Promised Land. They're coming from all over the known world in order to worship in this building. And many of them are not going to bring sacrificial animals with them. And they're not going to uh, bring... Uh, uh, coinage from the temple with them. So this is all set up originally for their convenience. Unfortunately, it has been turned into a racket by the, uh, by the Sadducee families that are in control of the temple. Uh, Sadducees do not believe in the supernatural. Uh, they look at religion as a means of controlling the population, uh, but they also see it as an opportunity to line their pockets because people will spend lots of money on religious things. Uh, so what's happening in all these little shops is that the Sadducee uh, priestly families are taking a cut and uh, the prices for these animals, the price, uh, the fee for changing your money is exorbitant. It's ridiculous. And so these people are being fleeced by the sheep or by the shepherds. They are the sheep of God, but they're being fleeced by the bad shepherds in control of the house of God. Now, four Passovers earlier, that is three years back, when Jesus first began his ministry, he cleansed out the temple courts of these people, chewed them out about it, well, they're back at it. Uh, Jesus probably saw that the afternoon before when he visited the temple briefly in the evening. But now he's ready to do something about it. And uh, I think I want to um, continue here in Mark's account. Mark eleven fifteen. 15. Now keep in mind, as I keep repeating, Mark more than likely wrote down the sermons, the, the preaching sessions about Jesus' ministry from Peter. So this is probably Peter's eyewitness account. So he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
So Jesus has shut down this racket that's taking advantage of the worshipers. And apparently there's some people that are using uh, the temple as a cut through uh, to take things from maybe the north to the south uh, of the city of Jerusalem. That is the northeast corner down to the southeast corner. Uh, going through the temple would be a shortcut. And so he won't let them do that either. Uh, and this is what he says, verse 17. He was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? Uh, that's from Isaiah 56. And that's true. When the temple was first built by King Solomon, according to the design and intent of the inspired King David, it was intended to be a worship site for all the ethnic groups of the world to come to and to meet God. And that's why the court of the Gentiles or the court of the nation surrounds uh, the temple uh, worship area for the Jewish people. So Jesus says, wasn't that the way it was supposed to be? Isn't that what the inspired scripture says this place is supposed to be? But you have made it a den of robbers. You've made it into a hideout for those that take advantage of other people and steal their stuff. So Jesus is upset that uh, his, his worship site is being used to fleece the sheep. Uh, now, let's jump over to the Matthew account because there are some other things happening at the same time. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now, blind and lame people could come to the temple and worship, but they had to stay in the court of the Gentiles, the court of the nations, because they were counted as being ceremonially unclean for entering the court of the women or the court of Israel. When these guys find out that Jesus is in the court of the nations, they seek him out and ask him to fix their problem, and he does so. So the ministry of miracles continues. Verse 15, when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, so they're seeing these miracles, uh, and the children crying out in the temple, Hoshiagna to the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David, save us to the son of David. They were indignant. So the authorities are mad that Jesus is still being treated as if he's Messiah. They want that stopped. Remember the day before, uh, during the triumphal entry, when the people were yelling these phrases, Hosanna and, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna to the king of Israel. When they were saying that the day before, the Pharisees in particular were saying, you need to tell your disciples to quit saying that. And Jesus' response was, if they quit saying it, then the, the stones that make up the temple complex would have to start saying it. Well, here are little kids repeating what they heard yesterday. And uh, they tell Jesus basically, do you hear what they're saying? Make them stop that. And Jesus' response was this. Yes, I do hear. But have you never read, and then he quotes from Psalm 8, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Uh, so Jesus basically says the kids are saying what's true. They are offering praise to God. And basically, I'm not going to tell them to stop. Uh, and uh, then verse 17 of our Mark 21 or Matthew 21 passage says, Leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So once again, we know at the end of the day, 
probably once the sun is pretty close to going down, uh, Jesus, as well as all the other pilgrims, kind of head away from the temple and go back to their homes, back to their campsites in order to spend another night and get ready for another day of Passover week. Now, in the Mark account, uh, Mark uh, number 11, verse 18, we are told the chief priests and the scribes heard all of this. Uh, that is the, the, the things that happened about him casting the, the money changers and things out of the temple. When they heard all this, they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So we keep being reminded that the leadership wants Jesus shut down. Uh, they've tried everything within their power so far, including threatening to kick people out of synagogues. And yet Jesus still remains very popular. Uh, Luke's account, Luke 19, 48. Let's read 47. He was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the city were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. So they can't quite get him shut down. Uh, and so they're going to start making plans for even more drastic measures. So that finishes up the 11th day of the first month. We go back to Bethany, spend the night, and uh, in the next morning, in the daylight, it will be the 12th day of the third, or the first Jewish month, which means that we are only a couple of days away from the crucifixion. Mark chapter 11, verse number 20. As they passed by in the morning, this is the morning of the 12th, 24 hours after he'd cursed the fig tree, they saw the fig tree withered away from its roots. Now that's shocking. Uh, the day before, it was in full leaf. It was perfectly healthy looking, except for the fact it didn't have figs on it like it should have. So now it's all shriveled up and dead. There's no leaves left on it. So Peter remembered, and he said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And so all the apostles are amazed by this, because even if a tree does die uh, on one day, it usually takes a few days before you see it really withered up. But here, 24 hours, that's all it took. Verse 22, now comes the object lesson. Uh, Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, now which mountain is he talking about? Because they're standing on the Mount of Olives right now. Mount Scopus, which is part of that Olivet Ridge, is to the north of them. But there's also... Uh, true Mount Zion, which is the Temple Mount, right there across the Kidron Valley from them. Uh, so which mountain is he referencing? I don't think we can be certain. Uh, the point is that you could say to any particular mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. Now, the sea is a long ways away. Uh, whether you're talking about the Dead Sea, which is to the east, or the Mediterranean Sea, which is to the west. So imagine Jesus saying here, if you truly have faith, you could say to a mountain, jump up, fly away 30-some miles, and dump yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that he, what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now, I have a question for you, and it's quite serious. Is this saying that all of us should be renovating the landscape by our faith to uproot mountains and move them around and fill in gullies and, and water uh, uh, low places? Is that what Jesus is teaching here? No. Uh, those are not the points of what we're supposed to be doing with our faith. 
Here's the point, verse 24. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Now, does that mean that we should have that name it and claim it attitude? The blab it and grab it. You know, where we can line our pockets, make ourselves wealthy uh, by the power of prayer. No, that is not the point again. Remember that only a couple of days from now, Jesus will be praying that this cup of the dying and having all the sins of the world laid upon him could pass from him. Didn't he have enough faith to take care of that? Sure. But what did he say next in the prayer? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Prayer is not about what we can get out of God. Prayer is about how we can do God's will in this world and in our lives. Prayer is much more about getting ourselves into alignment with Him rather than treating Him like a genie in a lamp and making Him get into alignment with us. I feel very strongly about this, folks. We have got to put a stop to this God will do whatever I tell him to do because I have faith attitude. Because that is a self-centered, sinful mindset. And it needs to be repented of. The things that we need to be praying about involve the salvation of other people. That is one of the biggest things that we could be focused on. So whenever you stand praying, here's another aspect of this to be paying attention to. Forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. This goes back to when Jesus taught them the model prayer. The disciples had asked, teach us to pray just like John taught his followers to pray. And Jesus says, here's a prayer for you. Our Father, who is art in heaven, hallowed, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. See the focus? It's about what God wants, not what we want. On earth, just as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need to get through this day. Give us our daily sustenance, just like the people in the wilderness had the manna and the water on a day-by-day basis. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But in the midst of all that, he also said, and forgive us our debts. That is, God, you forgive our sins in the same way that we have already forgiven the sins of others. We are to be merciful as God is merciful. And in the teaching of that model prayer, Jesus went on to say, If you do not forgive others freely from your heart, neither will God the Father forgive you. And so here is Jesus on the topic of prayer, not about name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, but rather When you pray, get yourself into alignment with God. And that includes forgiving the people who have asked you to forgive them, just like you have been forgiven by God when you asked him to forgive you. So let's be much more God-centric on our prayers and a whole lot less self-centric and self-serving in our prayers, okay? Now, we know that at the end of all that, uh, they had uh, gone back to Bethany, and now they're on the way back into Jerusalem. So, we're in Mark chapter 11, verse 27. They came again to Jerusalem. So, this is on the morning of the 12th day of the first Jewish month. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. So this is the bunch that didn't like what he did the previous day 
or the things that he was doing the previous day. They didn't like him throwing, you know, their stall people out of the temple, you know, cutting off their prophets. Uh, they didn't like the fact that the little children were singing nice things to Jesus and about Jesus in a prophetic way. They wanted that stopped, and Jesus wouldn't stop that. He was healing people that, in the Pharisaic mindset, were made that way by God. Understand that. A lot of the Pharisees believed if you were blind, you were blind because God made you that way, because you were a sinner or your parents were sinners. And so Jesus is on the outs with all of these guys. So they accost him in the temple when he arrives on this particular morning. Verse 28, they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? So they want to know from Jesus, who do you think you are? How dare you? try to stop commerce that's happening in the court of the nations. How dare you accept accolades from people as if you're the Messiah when we don't believe that you are? What gives you the right? So Jesus' response is this. Jesus said to them, I'm going to ask you one question. You answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So he tells them, I'll make a deal with you. Answer this question, then I'll answer yours. Was the immersion from, of John the immerser from heaven, that is from God, or from man? Answer me. So they discussed it with one another. They go buzzing off to the side. And this is what they say. If we say it's from heaven, from God, he's going to say, why didn't you believe him? That is, why didn't you go out there and get immersed? But if we say from man then we should be afraid of the people because they hold that John really was a prophet and, and they'll stone us. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, neither then will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Mark your place. We'll get back into the word here tomorrow, Lord willing.